Hello everybody and thank you for joining tonight. This is your host Nino and in tonight's episode it shall be my very good pleasure to guide you through the book List Processing by Foster from 1967, which is quite an exceptional book in that regard that it does not actually handle list processing through any specialized language, not even through Lisp. If at all, the examples are given in, a, in an algal-like syntax whereby the author argues that this is what people know. But it shows some more high-level principles of list processing and is thus quite a curious little gem which I found very pleasant to read and I hope you shall enjoy it as well. So let's jump straight ahead to page one. What he initially tells you is that computers are pretty good at handling problems with data when that data matches the computer's architecture, particularly the memory, and is in contiguous, like in continuous address spaces, like here, successive addresses. But for more complex interrelationships, the tool of choice, according to the author, are lists. And that it is not actually a new method. It is just, uh, yeah, he, he says that, these, that it's a system of practices which are widely current. This is in a way also true today, as many languages have list-like structures. In a, in a more or less obvious way to the user. But he does argue at the very end that this can actually be further improved. And it's fun because from today's perspective, quite some of his suggestions do get actually implemented. Now, he also mentions that the primitive operations on lists are not the same as the primitive operations on arithmetic. And here on page two, he continues to argue that, that the primitive operations on lists are more like search and combination and element access. So this is not like the same like plus and minus. And here he, as I told you, outlines that his examples will be given in Algol or an actually like algal-like language. On page 3, he proceeds to name a couple of list processing languages, which are nowadays, you know, interestingly, all dead except Lisp. So there is IPL, there is Lisp, of course, itself, there is FLPL, and he has omitted it here, but he mentions it later on, SLIP, and commit and if you feel that you may not have heard all of these names I don't know maybe you're not quite such a good paleontologist right <laughs> but that's really really not surprising nobody has been using these for decades mostly so when we go further to page six this is where he outlines that the main operations on lists concern operating on the addresses of the lists uh, of the elements rather than on the elements themselves and that the like the property of lists is that these elements can be chained together and this is, of course, something which are uh, here chained for general reuse and referred to as lists. And this is indeed what one is used to doing, right, when handling lists, handling such little connected boxes. All right, so 
This, for anyone who is acquainted with Lisp, is of course a known sight of little boxes pointing to other boxes and pointing to contents. And it's interesting to see how he demonstrates it as a general principle. And also here, list of lists as a more complex example. Indeed, what he then does is actually something rather amusing. He defines certain most primitive operations on lists. In particular, getting the head, like as HD of L, the head of a list, and the tail of a list, as TL. And if that looks to you very much like car and cutter in Lisp, then you're absolutely right. And in fact, the authors of Lisp themselves have later on argued that maybe head and tail would have been better names than car and cutter. But, you know, of course, the car and cutter thing have the advantage that you can so nicely compose them. But they actually introduced head and tail later on, and this author here uses that too. And later on he even admits that this is matching these Lisp functions. And very inconspicuously, on the next page, he also introduces cons. Oh, what a completely random idea, totally not connected to the main list processing language, if there ever has been one, right? So that's actually a bit funny. And then he proceeds to tell you what you can be doing with lists, like what you can be building and destroying with lists. So, actually, over here, yeah, operations on lists, and there he actually gives you a really fun example of how to reverse a list, and I mean, this is, in a way, let me focus a bit more on it. This is fun in a way, because this is really like the way it would have been written in Lisp if you would be only using the prog and go facilities, right? So, he basically tells you, cons the head of the list into the resulting list and change the main list into the tail of the list. And then, you know, you put again the head here and again the head on M, and that way the heads are building up on M while the main list is getting shorter until the main list becomes zero, and then you will have the reversed of the list in M. And then on the next page, however, he shows you also alternatives to this purely iterative view, namely a very nice introduction to recursion, actually, if you will. Like, his example here is a factorial function. He also gives you an example where you get the leftmost atom in a list of lists, even. Like here, Robbins and John, Smith, Joe, and the three in the end get Robbins and like you basically always left branch. And also an, a good definition of a recursive list. A uh, reverse list, I mean. So, so these are actually very nice definitions of recursion. And it is somewhat, somewhat entertaining to see them so nicely defined regarding list processing in a notation which is, you know, not Lisp at all. And then he proceeds to give you, in the next couple of pages, examples of recursion, like list flattening and an arithmetic evaluator. So like, if you want to build sort of a calculator. And then he briefly discusses for which algorithms a recursion might be a more um, proper choice and for which a, le a less proper choice. Now, the thing he does criticize about recursion, 
is that it uh, it assumes temporary memory storage, which you might need elsewhere. So that's like the big disadvantage of recursion, according to him, that it that if recursion is very deep, this may use a lot of storage because you're all the time having these like temporary variables. Then he goes on to mention something interesting. Uh, he talks about pushdown lists. Now nowadays we call these stacks, and he mentions how list operations can be actually implemented, you know, not with infix notation but with postfix notation. And if you do it with postfix notation, you can do away with all of the list notation in general and just simply have them this way. And then you have like the arguments and the function, the arguments and the function again, and so on. Like reverse Polish notation. And in that regard, you can only say, hello, fourth, greetings to you. <laughs> like, it's interesting to, to see that in, like in this book on lists. But it is without doubt a valid perspective and showing you the relatedness in a way between lisp and forth. Also, here he defines so inconspicuously a couple of functions, in particular set and set the head and set the tail, which is really like set q and r placa and r plug d if you know that from, from Lisp. So it's like funny that, again, he sort of borrows these concepts from Lisp, just calls them a little bit differently. And now, he actually also mentions something else that is quite interesting, namely a doubly linked list where, so to say, the linkage is not just going one direction, but also going back. And from the languages he mentions in the book, he indicates that, in particular, slip is having that model, and it allows for quick appending and quick reversal of lists, as you do not have to seek the last atom, but actually access it extremely quickly. So... That, that's interesting to, to see that noted. And he then also mentions that the atoms which you are referring to do not need to be extremely simple structures. In fact, he also mentions that the atoms themselves can be lists or consisting of further lists. And that it's just needed that some mark indicates that they are atoms. That's an interesting note because actually that's exactly corresponding to Lisp atoms, which themselves can be quite complex structures, like depending on whatever implementation or dialect you're having. And then he generally accentuates, with regard to vectors, the advantage they present in terms of access speed, in particular of accessing later elements. And this is, you know, also he mentions that maybe the pointers will, will eat up a lot of storage. But he does have respect of vectors. And clearly he even recommends to perhaps use lists of vectors. He, um, yeah, there you have that. This two vectors should be somewhere here. Here, there you have it. He proposes, for instance, here a vector of lists as an operation. Not, not, not list of vectors, but like vector of lists. And he does warn that the movement of um, vectors takes uh, a, a long time, that it's an extremely slow process. Then he goes on to present circular lists, and he mentions something really interesting, namely that circular lists can only be created as, like from 
by procedures which alter an existing list. Like, you, you have to have a normal list, which you then decided to turn somehow into something circular. And then he gives you examples of list processing, in particular, uh, such a sort of grammat grammaticality checker, like checking whether a, a sentence is corresponding to a given grammar with its grammar rules. And the idea which he's presenting is essentially that you're having these, like, rules, and then you're having the sentence, and you're going through the sentence, and you are trying to see whether any rules are applicable in the beginning of the sentence, and if they are, then you split the sentence, like, copy, into so many copies, as there are rules potentially matching. And... Oops. And thereby, you have the multiple copies of the sentence, and you try to pursue each of the, these according to the grammar rules. And essentially, if you can exhaustively go through the entire list, at least in one place, then the sentence must be ju judged as being grammatical. And it is indeed interesting that he mentions that there can be multiple possible structures of a, of a um, sentence matching. So, at least his proposal is interestingly more modern and that he is not so navy to propose that there is like one main structure or something, but he is just sincere that you may end up with several structures, actually. And then, this is, this is actually a really nice example. And then he goes on to talking a little bit about the garbage collection. And that you need some method of reclaiming storage. Like, uh, yeah, some method of reclaiming store. Because otherwise you will run out of cells that you can use. And that the issue with garbage collection is to determine whether the cells are actually used somewhere else or not. And that there are like essentially two ways of handling that, either automatically, like the system determines that it should do gar garbage collection, or that it could depend on the user. And if the cells are used elsewhere, of course they should not be reclaimed. So, as the question is, whether well, it should be an automatic process or, or not. And he mentions that on Lisp, of course, it is automatic. And that the idea is to, to notice whether there are any, any cells that are not pointed to by anything. And if there are such, then they will not be accessible by the system and can be deleted. Like if there is there are cells pointed to by no list head, then they are somewhere in free space floating and can be reclaimed. The difficulty he mentions is that sometimes the list head can be, as in this example here, can be implicit. So if you have tough luck, it may be that the garbage collection is running just before you have connected to certain cells and maybe that will be having undesired results. He also mentions how um, garbage collection is working in SLIP. It's actually quite a famous system. And because SLIP has doubly linked lists, it can reattach an unused list to a so-called free list rather quickly and easily because, you see, as the list is doubly linked, it just takes it and slams it onto the free list and doesn't have to go through it element by element, which is, of course, quite comfy. And he then mentions again that one of the reasons for list processing 
is to avoid moving information around. Like, that this is like the central topic of list processing, that you are just handling references instead of moving things themselves. And then comes a really fun chapter, like it's maybe my favorite chapter in the book, some typical list languages. And he explores IPLV, in which the famous general problem solver has been written. I'm not sure what it wasn't IPL4 though. This Lisp, Slip, which is the original language in which Elisa and the Doctor script were implemented, and due to the similarity of the name with Lisp, people tend to sometimes believe it was written in Lisp, but it wasn't. It was in Slip. And FLPL, a Fortran list processing language. Actually, these two, Slip and FLPL, can be both implemented in like are both on top of Fortran. Though I think that this one could also be implemented on top of another macro assembler. And finally, commit, which is a really fun language. And you can see which one of the dinosaurs turned into birds and which one you can only dig up. So one of the interesting and beautiful things he mentions here as questions of like, like what defines this language and what, what does it feel like? Here he asks like, is there a large library available? Are primitive list operations available to the user? Is the recursion easy? How fast is it? And like, are circular lists allowed? And, and so on and so forth. But what, what he very beautifully expresses is that what sort of structure does the language itself have? This is very important to the user since it colors his thinking more than anything else. I I found find a truly beautiful expression. And then he goes on to outline them. And I do have to tell you, man, IPLV really looks, looks like letter soup. And this language is disgusting. I mean, it's famous and so on. But when I look at this, I can't say that I have a feeling of knowing what is happening there. This is such an ugly language. I'm not able to say that I feel in any way sorry that it died. But yeah, that, that's what it looked like. So if you're interested in, in a sort of list assembler, this is what it would be looking like. And you can't express a list of lists just like that. You have to put little reference pointers and say there is an X and then the X would look like that and it contains a Y which itself would look like that. And everything looks incredibly unnecessarily complicated. He does mention though that the organization of IPL is based heavily on the use of pushdown lists. So I wonder in what way maybe IPL would have been similar to fourth, but given that IPL is dead as the dodo, I guess I'll never know. And then he goes to Lisp actually. And it's really funny because um Oh yeah, he mentions that an atom shouldn't be having more than 30 characters to it. And, of course, as in early Lisp was typical, that you could be replacing blanks and commas in order to separate the elements of a, Lisp, of a list. And he also talks briefly about um, M expressions, which is, let's say, something which generally was actually on the way out of fashion by that time. Like, people realized that this is not in, in any way particularly helpful to have to translate M expressions into S expressions, but he still mentions it. And then he does something funny. He's just, like, full disclosure, telling you that his little uh, definitions of head and tail in reality correspond to um, correspond to to, to, to to these list functions here about air plug and air plug D and so on 
like that. That's fun that he in the end actually tells you, you know, that stuff we used throughout the book. That, that actually has equivalence in Lisp. What's also interesting is that he mentions that Lisp has no provision for the use of auxiliary storage. That is, so to say, no virtual memory to Lisp. And then he talks a little bit about Slip, the language in which I told you that Weizenbaum in 1966 wrote Elisa and the famous Doctor script. So, or the thing with the like doubly linked list. So this is actually looking more human, yeah. And he tells you that it can be embedded in Fortran. I'm not an expert neither in Slip nor in the next one FLPL. But let's say both of them look a little bit more more normal than IPL V did, like IPL5 did. And then he mentions commit, which is a sort of string processing language. And essentially commit was apparently used for pattern matching and pattern manipulation. Not unlike the way you would nowadays use regular expressions or Perl. So that's an interesting introduction to the alternatives of Lisp. And we can see what other things existed. And perhaps that can give us a little bit more of, a, of an idea why Lisp, in a way, won the Lisp processing language competition. And he writes about slip that recursion can be done rather awkwardly and so on. So in that regard maybe it's understandable that with all its complexity for the untrained eye this was perhaps still simply the easiest option. And then he talks a little bit about the future of list processing and it's interesting that he advocates there shouldn't be a completely fixed language like which is, um, you know, like forcing things onto you, but that it should be one of the many techniques at the disposal of programmers. And he argues for some sort of fusion of properties of languages in order to give you such a like language which gives you multiple options, and that it should be having sequential operations, it should be having functional definitions as in Lisp and Algol, and it should have some descriptive commands, so I guess that's another word for regular expressions, as in commit. And it's funny, because arguably later languages such as, you know, more modern Lisp and Prolog, and nowadays even Python, do give you exactly such a mix of properties and of things you can be doing. And he tells you that List expressions need to look more intuitive. So, instead of writing this monstrosity here as a series of consas, it would be, of course, more welcome to simply express things that way, so you, so you understand, as a programmer, what is going on. And he gives a really fun example that instead of, like, giving a, a, a list operation like that, which is like consing, heads and tails and, and look, looking like a complete nightmare. That instead it should be something like there is such a list and we want to produce such a list. And you sort of remember which one is which and switch it into the correct place and not handle something terrible as this. And for that example actually I'm most reminded of Prolog because Prolog does exactly such deep pattern matching if you give it to it and in a way does it thereby has, a, has its strength a little bit over lisp so that's actually it it's a very brief book very nice i hope you enjoyed it and that was what lisp processing sort of looked like in the 1960s if you want to look a little bit beyond lisp and with that, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope to greet you here again as regular viewers. I wish you a wonderful evening. And from me, goodbye.